I just want to take a moment to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, I want to also thank our local business, Bolt Carlisle and Smith, for sponsoring our refreshments, and the City of Staten for graciously taping um, the event tonight, so that those that are unable to attend can watch it at home later. And lastly, I just want to thank you guys, the brave uh, candidates, for not only choosing to exercise your right to vote, but to take advantage of the opportunity to represent our community and be the change that you wish to see here. So, um, just a reminder to the candidates, this is not a debate. It's just an opportunity for you to inform the public of your goals and missions. Um, all candidates will be asked the same questions. We will rotate around candidates so that each participant has a chance to answer first. Um, please keep your responses civil. No personal attacks on other candidates, the moderator, anybody in the audience. Um, and candidates will have three minutes uh, to respond to each question. Uh, Pat in the red in the front is timing. Um, she will hold up a yellow card when you have one minute left. And then she'll flip it over to the red side when your time is up. Um, before we start with the questions, when Jennifer comes up, she will have you guys do a short one-minute introduction um, to introduce yourselves. So I'd now like to introduce Jennifer Tiger from State and Law. She will be our moderator for the evening. She has previously served as a member of the State and City Council, and she now lives in Sublimity, um, but practices law in her state and office. So thank you for helping out tonight. Thanks for asking me to do this, and thank you candidates um, for being here and also for running. Uh, that shows that you care for this uh, city and have concern for the community. It's an unpaid volunteer position, and it uh, requires a lot of time and dedication, so um, we appreciate you doing this, and we appreciate that you are all here, too, uh, coming to watch and participate and be involved in your community. Uh, so like Carmel said, uh, we'll let everybody uh, take a minute to introduce themselves. Hank, would you like to start? Sure. Can I come up here? Uh, I think we're just going to be seated. Really? <laughs> okay. Oh. I'm Henry or Hank Porter. Um, lived in <coughs> Staten for right at 50 years. Been doing this a long time, it seems like. Off and on, this is six terms. Um, Taught in the high school for 30 years. Um, spent time answering telephones. <laughs> <laughs> Probably important. Um, a wife and three kids, our uh, children were born here, uh, raised here, went through our schools. What else? Ran a little shop downtown for 10 years and served with Scott on the council. And then when he decided not to run, I ran. So we, he and I go back eight years as far as being mayor. And I was going to get out of it uh, because uh, I'm almost a senior citizen and <laughs> should probably be sitting back and taking it easy and um, that's not that's not me so uh, I decided to jump back in and partly because no one else had jumped in uh, we had council candidates and that's where the real power is because they were, they're the voters but um, I thought I could do it one more time uh, we've got a, an excellent staff and I'm very supportive of them, and we can get good things done. But um, that's who I am and kind of what's I'm, what I'm about. Thank you. Scott? Hello, I'm Scott Vigil. Um, born and raised in Staten, Oregon. Uh, spent some time in the Army, spent some time with the Oregon National Guard, um, also spent time with uh, different fire departments, and uh, I'm currently a lieutenant at uh, State Fire. 
I also uh, own a business called Cascade Pro Auto, do auto repair. Um, that's what I do for a living. Um, been, in, been involved with uh, the city for a while as a city councilor and as mayor for two terms. Um, <clears throat> I did, uh, in 2014, decide not to run. Um, my wife and I uh, adopted a 14-year-old, uh, a and that became a, 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 real, uh, a real responsibility at home um, that had to take up a lot of time. Um, so uh, he graduated this last year, um, and he was on his merry way of uh, joining the military. And uh, I was looking at uh, that, uh, yeah, I uh, got a lot I can, a lot, I, a lot of experience, um, a lot of different uh, leadership roles that I'm taking on in my life, and uh, I think I think the city can benefit from a from a good leadership person um, running meetings and uh, with the with the positive outlook I got that I bring to the table. Um, that's uh, that's where I'm. That's me. What's up? I'm Priscilla Gailey Blightwell, and I started my uh, kind of political activism career about 40 years ago. I was the first um, president of the Homeless Action Coalition, if you can rem if you can think back 45 years worth ago what that would have been like. But I actually went to Washington, D.C. and spent some time lobbying there uh, for um, housing programs in the state of Oregon. Uh, Came back, uh, had a career for about 35 years as a social worker. The last 12 years that I worked, I was the uh, director of so all of the social services for the St. Vincent de Paul organization out of Lane County, which happens to be the largest St. Vincent de Paul in the world. Uh, and so we had numerous programs for kind of anybody that was in the community from uh, veterans returning uh, into the community, re-entry programs for veterans, re-entry programs for prisoners I ran, I ran programs for drug and alcohol, uh, I ran programs for people that suffered from persistent and chronic mental illness. And so my life pretty much was social services. I have uh, degrees in psychology, family services, rehabilitation counseling of the deaf and hearing impaired, and many other things that are related to social work. Um, at the age of 55, I decided that I was going to try something different, and I resigned my position, and I bought a business, and that business was here in the state of Oregon. So I moved to state of Oregon 12 years ago, started a little business uh, that was not here previously, and in the last 12 years have grown that business to be a million dollar business now, here locally. I have always... Um, believed in giving back to the community. During my time of owning this business, I've also had a foster home that served 27 children. I've also been a uh, court-appointed special advocate for children, and my last three little girls that I was involved with got adopted at, in the courtroom last week, and it was a joyous day for me um, mm -hmm. after kind of a long journey with them. Uh, my belief is, is that everyone should be involved in their community as much as they can be. And so um, I've chosen this way here in Satan, a town that I moved to 12 years ago and loved dearly, um, to serve on city council. Well, um, first, thank you so much for um, hosting this because it's a great way to learn more about candidates and... Uh, um, more about the people that you're, you might be working next to um, on the council. If uh, my name is Paige Hook, I'm running for city council, and I have uh, grown up in this area. Well, spent about 15 years of my life here. I consider Staten to be my home. Um, I'm raising my three kids here, and that's really what has inspired me to um, run for city council. Is I want to be that change that Carmel was talking about. That uh, makes this community continue to be a great place to uh, raise your children. Um, I, I remember when I was um, sitting there uh, with my son watching YouTube videos of the, the council meetings, um, I thought to myself, you know, I think we need something new. We need um, some, some new people to represent all the demographics. Um, and I, I feel like I'm one of those people, along with a few of the candidates, here, I, I also agree, would be great representatives. So um, 
Right now I'm a planning commissioner. Uh, I've been doing that since February. Um, I, um, I feel like I know what it's I know what it's like to struggle uh, growing up. When I was when I was little, um, we weren't always financially sec financially secure. Um, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous if you can't tell. Anyway, we weren't always financially secure, and I just want to um, be able to be the voice for people that maybe don't have the ability to show up for council meetings all the time. I want to be the person that you can email or call, and I'll get back to you, and um, I will uh, advocate for you. Um, so that everyone is represented uh, in our community. Um, some people, they work different hour jobs and they just can't uh, be, be at evening meetings or um, even don't have the means to watch things on YouTube or, or know how to reach out to the, the counselors. So um, anyway, that's kind of what, why I'm running. I'm running because I want um, to be the voice. I want to be the compassionate voice on the council that um, asks the right questions that um, make sure that uh, we, we're we making the right decisions on the council. So, anyway, Ralph. Uh, my name is Ralph Lewis. <coughs> I've lived in Staten since, um, well, full-time in Staten since 1998. Um, prior to that, uh, was in and out of the community. Uh, loved this place. Uh, got the opportunity to move back here in 98, well in 94, excuse me, and um, have raised all of my children here. I have five sons. They've gone through the school system. Uh, none of them have been in jail. None of them are, <laughs> are convicted felons in any way. Uh, they're all good people. Uh, most of them still live here. Um, I was appointed to the um, Planning Commission by Mayor Gerard in, um, in 98, and was on the uh, Planning Commission uh, until the state decided they wanna know, wanted to know what all my family was up to and what they were spending their money on and that kind of thing, and I said, well, I don't think I wanna do this anymore because I don't think they need to know that. Um, anyway, that, got, that measure got, repe got repealed so I ran for uh, city council, um, got onto the city council, was there for a couple of years, um, and then went back to uh, being on the planning commission. Um, Paige and I are uh, on the planning commission. Uh, I'm the chair, she's the compassion. Um, <laughs> she's very good at that. Uh, so I'm sure if she gets to be on the city council, she'll be very good at compassion there as well. Um, like Mrs. Gladwell, my family um, did foster care. Uh, actually, my sons and I just kind of lived it. My wife was the foster parent. Uh, we had, oh, we did it for 17 years and we had close to 200 kids go through our house. Um, and go through your house is really aptly <laughs> stated because they certainly go through things. Um, I would like to be back on the plan on the on the city council. Um, I think I have things to offer, and um, vote for me. <laughs> Jordan, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, my name is Jordan Arts, and uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the Chamber and City for having this event and allowing us uh, the opportunity to speak and let you know what we're all about. Um, my husband and I recently moved here to Staten. Uh, we bought a home that was in his family and I told him that if we ever moved from where we lived previously in Salem that it was going to be Staten. Um, there's just something about this community that I've always been drawn to. Um, I work in the Willamette Valley all over the place and um, when I come here this is one of my favorite places. Um, growing up both of my parents were in the Navy and we spent most of our well, my childhood overseas and one of the things that was missing from while we had a great adventure we got to see lots of places one of the things that was missing was um, a place to be able to put down roots and so coming here um, coming back to a place where my husband has roots is just really um, maybe excited to
be able to be a part of this community and see uh, Staten thrive. I've met a lot of people recently, uh, business owners and just uh, real doers in the community that want to, that have that same vision um, and that, that's really why I'm, I'm running. Um, I feel like I have the energy, I am passionate, um, I am a good listener, I'm a good team player, and I feel like whatever you come to, if you come to me with concerns or comments or things that you want to see, you know, the, that's what I'm here for, is to make sure that the community is heard, that all residents are heard, and um, just be the voice for, for our community. So thank you. Thank you. David. Hello, my name is David Patty. Uh, last, I hope not least. Uh, I have two children and an exchange student, also not felons, so that's great. <laughs> uh, she's four, so she has some <laughs> Anyhow, um, So let's see, I moved to this community in 2001. I love the small town feel. It's awesome. And I have the uh, luxury of going through our school system here and graduating from State High. Uh, terrific experience. Um, Afterwards, I spent a year at Chemeketa Community College and decided that I was going to be impatient. And I joined the military and did four years of active duty service. Uh, I was based out of Edwards Air Force Base in California. Loved my time doing that. Uh, I also got to take a little trip to Afghanistan for a few months. Also enjoyed that. Um, afterwards, I really liked the job, but I, I wanted to move back to Oregon. I wanted to come back to Staten, so I got out of the active duty and I bought my first home in 2013 over in the uh, Cardinal area there. Uh, decided we need a little bit more space, so last year in 2017, I bought a, a place in uh, Cooper Court off of Jefferson. Um, I love my little neighborhood there, it's, it's amazing. Um, let's see a little bit more about me. Uh, my wife is also from this community. She also went through the school. Uh, we're very invested in its future very invested in making sure to keep some of those distinguishing things that I think Paige actually talked about. I totally know what she means by that. Um, you know, there's some things that I discussed with our city manager as well, and he talked about having pride in those little unique details, like, you know, the pool, keeping the library going, all these little things. Um, the movie theater, it's just, I, I think it's all terrific, and I want to be a part of maintaining that. I want to be a part of making the roads better, all these different things that I see that we could just do a little bit better and there's so much potential and I, I want to be a part of tapping that and moving us forward. Thank you. Thank you. We'll get to the questions. There's seven questions. <coughs> uh, Mar Carmel said we will rotate who gets to go first on each one. I'd remind you that answers are limited to three minutes each and uh, we'll be keeping track on these questions. So. Hey, uh, what do you see as the primary role or responsibility of a mayor? Well, you called on me. I did. <laughs> well, probably the easiest way to answer that is, you know, run a good meeting. Um, I think uh, Scott's going to say some of the same thing. That that's that's kind of important. He had to wrestle with um, uh, forces almost beyond control sometimes, but was able to do it. Uh, I had the luxury of a pretty good council that uh, agreed most of the time, or at least there was a voting majority, and so it, uh, it was a little easier. Um, the, role, the role of mayor changes. Um, it's a weak mayor system. I don't vote unless there's a tie. There hasn't been one in four years. I've known mayors, the one here tonight, that had ties all the time. They had ties every meeting. And he got to vote. <laughs> and loved it, I think. Uh, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't had that, uh, that luxury, I guess. Um, you have to be careful. Let's say we, uh, we want somebody that's really assertive. I want things done. Uh, he's going to run into a city bureaucracy that may have different ideas. Uh, now you can you can run the staff, or you can let the staff do its job. You hire a city manager, 
That's what he's supposed to do. Uh, I could tell the police chief, chief, we need to do this. But I'm in immediate conflict with my city manager. So it's a, it's a different, the role has changed over the years, I think. And uh, I just, I don't think I'm passive, but I just am not maybe as pushy as some people would like. If you want somebody pushy, you're going to look for new staff people. I can promise you that. Okay? Scott, what do you see as the primary role or responsibility of the mayor? <clears throat> the role of the mayor of Staten is uh, to represent the city in a positive direction and to, uh, most of the time, we all want the same things, and we all just have a little bit different way of coming about, going about it. And the main, the main job of the mayor is to make sure that we can figure out what, what we're trying to do and try to focus that into um, the right channels, into the right, the right departments, and make sure that the right departments are taking care of whatever that need is. So if somebody comes to you and they want something done, um, knowing where to direct them. Um, and then also being able to um, get along with multiple different personalities. I'm not saying that everybody has multiple personalities. I'm just saying <laughs> that you have um, several people that you get a, got to get along with. Um, and, you ha and, and you can't just assume <coughs> because they don't agree with you that they must be just completely out in another world. Well, you sometimes just, they are. <laughs> um, and, and that's and, and that's an, that's an enjoyable um, an, an enjoyable thing for me is to is to see different points of view and, and to understand where they're coming from. Um, so when you when you do have those uh, that lively bunch or that lively conversation, it, it's it's something to di not not be like. I'm just going to push because I want my way. I, you got to listen and you got to understand what where they're coming from, where, where and what what the overall goal is. <clears throat> so, the job of the job of the mayor of the city of Staten is to get along with people and represent the town in a positive way. Priscilla, what do you see as the primary role or responsibility of a city councilor? That, um, actually my idea of what a city councilor does has not changed. I've been a city councilor here now for four years. Um, and I uh, came into the job thinking that my job was to represent the people who voted for me um, and to represent their voice when they came to me. What I have learned in the last few years is that um, that is not always allowed. Uh, by um, different uh, ways that things are done that you are not always allowed to talk to who you want to talk to or bring forward what they might want to have said, to say. So that being said, uh, I still believe that what you should be doing as a city councilor is is uh, looking at what your city's needs are, listening to the people that voted you into office and what they want the city to be, and to be working towards those goals in conjunction with the people that you're, that uh, are, on, are also on the city council. I do believe that one of the um, greatest assets of being a city councilor is being able to have some experience and know how to work as a team so that you don't put a cog in things and nothing happens and nothing gets done, that sometimes you do have to make compromise in order to move something forward for the, for the good of the city. Uh, and so you have to be a, a good team player. You have to uh, be respectful of people that have views other than yours. And I think that you have to have integrity and honesty. Paige, what do you see as the primary role or responsibility of the city councilor? So for me, um, I see the role of the city councilor as a conduit between the city staff or the city manager, because that is who um, 
the city council should be only really speaking to is the city manager because he is um, in charge of the city staff. And then um, between a conduit between them and the residents, the, uh, whether you vote or not. Um, I hope you vote, but uh, you are representing everyone that lives in Staten. Um, I believe that the role is to make unbiased decisions, to not bring in your own personal interests to the council. Um, I believe that it's also to move the city forward by working with other councilors. Um, I feel like I, I even if I, I don't know the other councilors, I feel like by being at the council meetings for the last year and then watching past ones on YouTube, I feel like I kind of know some of these councilors. Um, and I know that Councillor Quigley and Councillor Mullen, I would, I would love to work with them. There's um, a few uh, people uh, that are candidates that I would love to work with also because I feel like our um, values and vision for the city, they really align. Um, and, it, and it aligns with what I've heard other residents say that they want for the city. Um, and I believe that uh, our city staff is, is great. And I think that that's part of your role as a counselor is to um, get out there and tell uh, residents what's going on in the city and, and knock on the doors and um, let them know of any programs that, that maybe they didn't know about. Maybe they don't have access to um, certain programs. Like there's grants that are out there that I, I didn't know even existed until I was more involved in the city. And so um, just making those connections with residents is, is super important. And it can be awkward to knock on someone's door. And, and they don't know you, and I know if someone's knocking on my door, I'm not always that excited about it, but um, some of the conversations that I've had when I have been out on the doors have been really great. Um, so that's what I, I feel like is the role of the city council. Just, you have to be bold, you have to um, put your own ideas aside sometimes and, and really fight for um, what, what's best for everyone and what is fair. Ralph, what do you see as the primary role or responsibility of a city councilor? Well, it's actually already been said. <laughs> Mostly, I think as a city councilor, you want to um, ideally uh, represent the people. But as mentioned, uh, sometimes the rules get in the way. Uh, I think it's important that you keep your mind open and keep your eyes open and um, look for ways to maybe change the rules. Sometimes rules need to be changed to uh, meet the needs of, uh, of all of us. Um, I think the, in, the, in the, the structure of the city government that we have, uh, no single city councilor can do anything. Um, we're a team. And as a team, um, we have to work together. We have to work together. If we don't work together, then we're tripping over each other. And you lose. Um, we don't want you losing. You're a bunch of winners. This is a winner place. So um, that's really uh, my perspective on a city councilor. And hopefully, that will be where I fit in. Thank you. What do you see as the primary role or responsibility of the city councilor? That's a good question. Um, it, the sentiment, I believe, has already been um, said, but being a representative for the community and um, representing the people in that being good stewards of the community's money, um, how we allocate that for uh, different programs, um, different budget items, um, doing the will of the people, kind of said that, and setting goals and policies that reflect what the community wants. Um, obviously, there's, you know, there's over 7,000 people that live here, so we're not going to make everybody happy, but um, being able to work together to make our community thrive is really, you know, the end game and the end goal here, and then working cohesively with the city staff. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we do all have the same goal of wanting to make sure that our community um, is thriving and that we are, you know, people enjoy living here and they want to stay here and that's really the goal of the city council. Thank you. David, what do you see as the primary role or responsibility of the city council? Well, a lot of it's already been said. I'm really enjoying going last. So <laughs> what I'm saying 
what I can say to distinguish from some of the things that have already been said. Um, you know, as a labor union president, oftentimes you have to be the bearer of some bad news or you have to just hear somebody out because they just want to be heard and you can't do a lot for them. And a lot of the times that's the dynamic in city council meetings. People come, they're upset, there's something that you can't change as a city councilman, but you can hear them. And you can take that input and put it in the back of your mind and bring it up when, it's some when the time comes for you to do something about it, right? So that's a big part of it. And unfortunately, sometimes I see, at least on these YouTube, you know, I, I also watch those and I go to city council meetings when I can and get away from the family and, and watch that. Sometimes that's, that, that's the nature of the dynamic and it's frustrating for everyone in the room. But the other important thing is to be able to have a civil discourse with other city councilors and be able to have these interactions where something constructive comes of the conversation. It's not just people yelling at each other or whatnot. And I'm not saying that that's going on all the time. I'm just saying that that's something that I, I will not be a part of. And that's my pledge to you. I will always listen to every member of the community and hear what they have to say, weigh it, the uh, you know, cost-benefit analysis, so to speak of every decision that we make. Uh, I also really, as I was already said by one of you guys, um, being good stewards of uh, our money, that's really important. And um, making sure that things we spend our money on have good, they pay out a good cultural dividend, or not cultural dividends, but good, good dividends later on to the community. That's important. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will be uh, starting with Scott. What experience or community involvement do you bring to the table that you feel makes you an asset to the position you are running for. All right. <clears throat> I think uh, I've had the uh, Roberts Rules Board kind of ingrained in me since I was about uh, uh, high school. Um, from uh, from ASB into uh, going into fire department. I, I started uh, with the Gates Fire Department. So I grew up here in State and I moved to Mill City. Um, well, I didn't move to Mill City. I moved to Gates. But I went to Mill City High School, Sandy M High School for all of those people don't know that, but uh, Gates, Oregon, um, got really involved with that fire station, um, just fell in love with helping people and being a part of an organization that, that does that kind of work, um, and in that, there's a there's structure and there's the same kind of thing, we've got meetings, and I've been a part of going to meetings since I was 16 years old, um, been, been a part of uh, knowing that it you're not going to do anything on your own. You're knowing that in, in order to do great things, it's going to take the work of several people. Um, <clears throat> so that experience, um, starting there, uh, also just, uh, where did I go from there? I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty big deal, being a, a firefighter for the last, what, 20 what year is it now? 22 years. Um, so, uh, and, and every month you have a business meeting. Um, every month for since for the last 22 years, I've been part of um, some sort of a uh, some sort of a Roberts Rules of Order type of meeting, um, which is how how we run things um, at the city at the city level. Um, so, <coughs> having that background, and then um, having a uh, my, my profession as an automotive technician is I've, I'm always solving some sort of a problem. I'm looking for, I'm gathering information all the time. I have one minute left. I'm always gathering information and trying to find out, you know, what this, what, what, where do we have common ground? And how can we put this together and solve the actual problem that we have? Um, and again, I, uh, I mentioned I had a, uh, Three years of city council, two terms of mayor. Um, this is not a this is not a new thing for me. Um, I I I'm, uh, got lots of experience I can bring. Thank you, Priscilla. What experience or community involvement do you bring to the table that you feel makes you an asset to the position you are running for? So I'm kind of with Hank. I'm like old. <laughs> so <laughs> not to say that you're old. <laughs> 70 years of community experience, but I'm going to um, talk about specifically about community experience here in Staten. When I decided
decided to make this my home 12 years ago, I immediately started looking around to, to try and find ways that I could um, contribute to the community. So the first thing I, I did was join the Chamber of Commerce. I uh, served on, um, I don't know if it was the first, it probably wasn't the first, but it was one of several of the organizations that was trying to work on the downtown Old Town area um, and do some things there. It was, I think, this is the fourth one that I have been involved with, the current one that was there, but there had been many before that. Also, as a social worker, when I came into this community, I realized that there was no connectivity with social services in this community to help those people in this community that are disenfranchised, either locally here in Staten or at the canyon. So I was the uh, uh, one of the founders of the what was then called the Canyon Collaborative, which is now uh, an entire program that is um, run out of the hospital here locally, specifically to get all of the social service agencies um, here and up the canyon together once a month to talk about helping people. So um, I'm really proud to have been one of the founding members of that program. Um, I also uh, was one of the um, kind of founding members of the new teen center that is happening. Uh, actually pulled people together for that. Uh, looked for a, a home, uh, a nonprofit that could do that locally. Um, also uh, served three years as the state director of a program called Safe Families for Children, which is also run here locally. And that's a program that looks at um, helping children walking along next to families before they get involved in the system with child welfare. And so um, I, um, it's kind of, I, I believe that I was born a social worker, and, and so I'm constantly looking around to try and do things to, to, help, uh, to help people, to help our community. My focus the last few years has really been on making Staten not a bedroom community to Salem, but in keeping Staten its own wonderful small town that has all of the things. Thank you. Paige, what experience or community involvement do you bring to the table that makes you, make, that you feel makes you an asset to the position you are running for? So um, I, when I, I've always been involved in communities um, that I've grown up in. So I, I grew up in the state and surrounding area. Um, I was in Sayo for a while. We lived here in Staten for a while. Um, and I, I mean, I drive by trees that I planted in Sio or trees that I planted in Salem, or um, I'm involved in a Rotary Club uh, in Salem because I, I work in Salem, and I I helped out I helped out this last year with the um, one of the events that the local Rotary Club uh, put on because I I can't attend the meetings but I wanted to be involved in in something you know local. Uh, I have three kids that are under six years old. Um, and so for a while, I didn't have a lot of time to get out and be involved. Um, when my last child was born, um, he's 19 months now, um, he, I started watching the YouTube videos that I've referenced before of, of the council meetings. And then um, when he was nine months old, and kind of a little bit more um, easy for other people to watch, I started attending the meetings. Um, uh, Mayor Porter appointed me to the planning commission uh, when my uh, son turned one, like around that time, right before he turned one. Um, and so I've been on that for a while now. Um, I feel like my experience, I, I have a lot of experience in, in training. I'm constantly developing uh, myself. I have been to a few leadership trainings that have given me a lot of skills in, in learning to listen and work with other people and um, even even work really well with like difficult personalities, which pop up a lot in life. So um, I feel like I have a, a lot of assets that I can bring to the council. Um, I have training in crime analysis, and um, my professor, who's a uh, he was the president of the International crime, uh, Association of Crime Analysts, he uh, put me in the top uh, five percent of his students that he's ever had in twelve years of teaching at that point, um, which it's. I have this analyst mindset, so I can I can really look at 
uh, problems and look at them from different angles and um, look at them in an organized way. Um, so I feel I, I just have a lot that I can bring. Um, I know there's a lot of candidates that I can tell just from sitting here listening to them and reading their voter pamphlet statements. They have a lot to bring too. Um, but each of us has our own unique uh, skill set and I think that mine is, is very unique of what I can bring to our council. So. Ralph, what experience or community involvement do you bring to the table that you feel makes you an asset to the position you are running for? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> um, well, I was, um, like I said earlier, I was appointed to the Planning Commission um, back in the late 90s, um, was uh, steadily on the Planning Commission um, until that bill passed and I didn't like that bill, so I quit. Anyway, then uh, at some point in there uh, as well, I was on the Parks Board. Um, when I was on the city council, I was the liaison to the parks board. Um, attended all of those meetings. Um, then I was on the city council for a couple of years. Um, I read all the minutes from uh, current um, city council meetings. Uh, through my work, um, I do what's called adult protective service. And I go to people's homes, and uh, we see people who are uh, sometimes um, downtrodden. Uh, and uh, it's our responsibility as a protective service worker is to help them figure out what to do with that. And um, there are a lot of programs that people have available to them that they don't know. And uh, I'm connected with uh, an agency that provides a lot of those programs, so it's pretty simple to go, okay, well, this person needs this, and then uh, explain that to them, that this is available to them, and sometimes they light up and they, <coughs> they accept that. Other times, they don't want anything to do with, with the government. So you uh, try to let them know how it's going to be uh, better for them if they um, get involved. Um, I think it's important that um, that we don't try to run over people. People have a, uh, an opportunity to choose. They get to choose what they get to do. And um, you want to be respectful at all times. Jordan, what experience or community involvement do you bring to the table that you feel makes you an asset to the position you are running for? Thank you. Um, so I am a local real estate agent, and if you ask me what I do, I always joke that I put out fires all day. Um, that's basically what you do. There's all these things coming at you. There's several different people involved um, at any given time, and my job is to make sure that things smooth, run smoothly. Um, so in that way, I basically project manage. Um, I have had leadership roles in my women in networking group. I was the past director and I'm currently the assistant director. Um, I also spend a lot of my time as an advocate for parental rights and informed consent. It's kind of a passion of mine. Um, and I'm also the mother of a three and a four year old. Um, so I feel like in that in and of itself, being a mother um, really kind of helps you learn to share with others, um, all those little things that you learn in preschool and kindergarten uh, really do help when you're trying to work with a group. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> right? um, but like I said before, um, I'm a good listener, I'm a good team player, I work well with others, um, I feel like my background, uh, moving around a lot, I've had to kind of um, mesh with different cultures, different people, um, all while you know, staying yourself, but still, it's a whole like compromising as a group, um, but still standing firm for what you believe. Thank you. David, what experience or community involvement do you bring to the table that you feel makes you an asset to the position <coughs> you're running for? Thank you. Uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, I've been local labor union president for a little while now, uh, and that experience 
have a lot of time interpreting collective bargaining agreements, uh, understanding the constraints on, uh, on my executive board. And in this role, I could also understand city charter and the constraints that we're under for that. Um, additionally, in community service wise, I have had the luxury of uh, doing some food service uh, at the Salem Mission with uh, Councilor Joe Wesselman. Whenever I can tag along, that's always fun, and just to kind of talk to people and see what it's like to be there. I mean, I don't have any experience with that. I don't know what it's like to you know, experience severe mental illness or drug addiction, and, and hearing some of those stories and, and the things that these people are up against, that's really interesting and enlightening to me. And then so taking that experience here and being able to understand that those people are always going to be underrepresented in the local government process, unfortunately, and having that in the back of my mind. Um, additionally, I, I also uh, have a crime analysis skill set, uh, something me and Paige share in common. Uh, I've been doing that uh, with the state now for about six months, and um, it's a lot of fun. And it also teaches you to be very analytical and you know, look at just the facts. What are the things that are provable? And take those and make a decision based on them, right? So I could take that as well to my city council time. Thank you. Hank, what experience or community involvement do you bring to the table that you feel makes you an asset to the position you are running for? Lots of experience. <laughs> 40 years of experience. I almost became a firefighter. About 1971, Dan Brower and I at the high school decided we wanted to do something in the community. And there was an appeal for volunteer firefighters. So we thought that would be a good, good thing to do. And then we went down to the principal's office and told him about our great plan. And principals being principals, They weren't all that, he wasn't, Bert Simmons wasn't all that concerned about it. He said, who's going to cover your classes? Well, that went, there went that idea. So we never became volunteer firefighters. <laughs> and, uh, but lots of other volunteering, lots of other things. Um, I don't know, about 35 years of it uh, involved with the schools, but uh, let's see. Oh, God, started on the council in 74 to 78, mayor from 79 to 85, back on the council, I think, 92 to 96, uh, mayor again in 99 and 2000, back on the council in 10 or 12, from the 10, 10, and then the last four doing, doing the job. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, trying to make meetings enjoyable. I think I like to entertain a little bit. I like to let people talk. If they've got something to say, I try not to restrain them too much. And we get, we get the wing nuts that are up there yelling at us. Bartenders calling you names. All kinds of interesting experiences. Um, I think probably tolerance and patience is, is my biggest asset. I hope it is. And, uh, and trying to enjoy the experience. Thank you. Our next question will start with Priscilla. What role do you feel business plays in ensuring a positive future for state and its surrounding areas? Did we do you? Yeah, we started with Scott. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was so worried about that Scott didn't get a turn that I didn't hear your question. So was <laughs> question. What role do you feel business plays in ensuring a positive future for state and surrounding areas? I believe it plays a huge, huge uh, part in, in us being exactly what I talked about before. Instead of being a bedroom community to Salem where people just come home at night and sleep, um, the fact that we have businesses here, hopefully that can be supported by our local people, um, is like the ultimate of what keeps us 
having our own small town, that we're, we're having a place that we can go and buy food, we're having a place that we can go and buy clothes, we're having a, a place that we can go and uh, buy our, our coffee on Saturday mornings, and we have a place that we can do it. When we start losing businesses, uh, because they aren't being supported locally and they aren't, um, uh, they decide to move into where there's a bigger population like uh, Salem, then I think that we lose uh, a, a great asset to our community and I think that we will die without it. I think that again, I, I think that we have, you can look around the country and see that has happened to many other, other small small towns that have just become part of the larger community that they are near. And so I think that we need to be very intentional in Staten about promoting local businesses that can be Staten businesses, locally owned and operated and living in our community and supported by our community. Thank you. Paige, what role do you feel business plays in ensuring a positive future for Staten and surrounding areas? So um, I've actually thought a lot about this, uh, being that it's the Chamber of Commerce, <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> and so um, I may refer to my notes so I don't mess up what I what I want to say. Um, but supporting local businesses means jobs. It means um, that we can have uh, residents that have paychecks that can. Um, make it so that they can have a decent a decent life here in Staten. Um, it means entrepreneurs that um, are able to provide for their family and live their dream at the same time. Um, I feel it's really important that you support, or that we all support current businesses, but also encourage new businesses to come into town. Because I know um, there there's a, a group that a lot of you are aware of and many of you are a part of. It's uh, called Revitalize Downtown Staten. And they've been working really hard um, to figure out what it is that Satan needs and, and what it is that Satan wants. And I know that um, reading some of the, the research that they have uh, gathered through, uh, they're going through some uh, like a local state or a state agency um, to gather some of the information. Um, but anyway, w learning what, what people have said, I'm like, yeah, me too. Like, that's how I feel too. Oh, wow, yeah, that would be great for Satan. I'm so glad I'm not the only one that wishes these things for Staten. So if you haven't had a chance to check out their um, the research that they have they have gathered, I'd like to see more residents um, involved in in the in the surveys that they put out. But um, it's it's really uh, enlightening to see that. Um, but we do need to grow our businesses. But part of that is um, we have to, to be more friendly to entrepreneurs that come in. We need a more streamlined process that makes it easy for anybody to understand how to open a business. I've talked to um, business owners that have successful businesses here in Staten, and I've talked to you know ones that have not um, been able to successfully open up a business. And they both said, uh, both, both people that I talked to specifically about this is, um, it's not easy to open a business in Staten. It's, it's a little bit confusing sometimes. And so um, I, I don't feel like our, our local, um, I don't feel like, like Staten should be the barrier. Um, let's let some other agency be a barrier, but let's not let Staten be our own barrier to having a thriving community and a, um, a thriving economy. Um, I believe that our current city leaders, they are on board with this vision. Um, I feel like sometimes there, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of uh, just miscommunication between some, some parties that are trying to work forward together, but that maybe they're not realizing that they are really aligned because what I see is is a lot of uh, community members that, that share this vision and want, um, <laughs> they, they, they want to see state and businesses grow and more people to come in. Ralph, what role do you feel business plays in ensuring a positive future for state and surrounding areas? <clears throat> I think, as Ms. Glidewell says, that without business, the place is dead. And <clears throat> I personally don't want this place to be dead. I love this place. Um, I think it's important that, as Paige said, that we, that we encourage them, that we make it work for them, um, hold their hand, get them through. Um, I think it's important that um, we let people be creative. 
Um, and we don't want the process, the system, to um, hamper that. Um, I understand that there's a need for a system, but I don't think, I don't think the system should um, make it so that people don't want to come here. Um, but I guess the bottom line is that uh, without businesses, there is no state, at least not the state we want. Thank you. Jordan, what role do you feel business plays in ensuring a positive future for state and surrounding areas? Thank you, that's a good question. Um, as a small business owner myself, I believe it plays a, an important role. And it's already been said, but uh, we wouldn't have a community without it. And I firmly believe that um, we can succeed as our own community, pretty self-sustaining. I don't want it to be a bedroom community, like Priscilla said. Um, that's one of the um, one of the reasons that I wanted to run too is because I'm passionate about making sure that Staten can be a place where people can live, work, and play. Um, when we moved to the community as a mother with young children, um, I saw the need for uh, more places, more entertainment places for kids with children. Um, as we go into the winter months, um, it's not really feasible to go out and play at the park every day. Um, so encouraging new businesses into town and working with the council to make it easier. Again, it's been said, but uh, looking over our policies to make sure that they are business friendly and that we are making it so people want to come here, um, bring their businesses here. We can tap into um, the canyon. Um, I know that RDS's research, and Paige again mentioned this already, but RDS's research says that uh, Satan isn't our only um, the residents here aren't the only ones that utilize the services. Uh, the people in the canyon would would rather come here than go all the way into state or excuse me to Salem. Mm -hmm. So if we can find a reason to um, have them come here, not only just to shop for groceries, but to stay longer, uh, go downtown, go go eat, have some more entertainment things to do. Um, you know we can tap into that and have more of the dollars stay here in our community as opposed to going into Salem where it's not going to come back to our community. David, what role do you feel business plays in ensuring a positive future for state and surrounding areas? Well, I think there, if I remember right, from my short stint on the uh, budget committee, there are about 300 businesses or more here. And I will say that it is important that they flourish. It's important that as city government we allow them to flourish. Uh, as far as the process for getting them up and running, um, every step really needs to have a reason. It shouldn't just be arbitrary. Uh, I think that there, I remember from the experience with, um, I believe it was Sunshine Coffee coming through and, and trying, to, trying to get up and starting. There were a lot of hurdles and some of the city code I remember being discussed and that a lot of that seemed really arbitrary. And I believe one of the members of the community brought up and said, you know what, these are on the books. We have to follow the code. If you want to change the code, that's great, but not right now for these people and then I don't remember hearing anything else about changing the city code some of those rules that were a little archaic and outdated so you know maybe looking at that and trying to facilitate some positive relationships saying okay I'm a new business I can't get through because of this okay well what's this and what can we do to change it or lower the bar so to speak while balancing the needs of the community citizens as well right so that's important to me but just, I guess in summary, just keeping communication and the dialogue going and keeping it uh, you know, positive discourse, not just where Hank was mentioning uh, people coming and just yelling at you, but maybe, maybe finding a way to break through some of the passions and just get some, some constructive feedback to where you have some actionable solutions. Back to you, Hank. What role do you feel business plays in ensuring a positive future for state and surrounding areas? Well, it's easy. Business is good. And that's what this, this crowd wants to do. I mean, that's fine. Um, I want to <laughs> throw one at you that uh, probably no one else discusses. And if they do, they probably don't tell anyone. Um, I get a lot of, in fact, I got it from my. Uh, person removing the growth from my head today. Uh, 
a haircut. <laughs> Didn't know where that was going. <laughs> um, she said, oh, I wish we were like Silverton. And you get that a lot. And you go, oh, Lord, why? <laughs> Silverton's a different community. Um, and there's another, here, here's, here's a, an impediment, I think, uh, and certainly for them and, and maybe for us. Um, go to Silverton and take off on Silverton Road towards Salem. And there's at least two, maybe three, cross streets. Uh, Howell Prairie is one, I know, and a couple of others. And then you get to, um, you get to Cordon, and you go on down Silverton Road, past the fairgrounds. You're still not in downtown Salem, and how long has that taken? Half an hour? What happens when you get out to the golf course here and get on this four-lane piece of pavement? In 15 minutes, you're at Costco, Walmart, Walmart. Walmart. Uh, it's just too easy. It's too easy for us to run in there. Yes, we need local business. We need to encourage local business. Yes, sometimes we make mistakes, but I don't think it's reasonable that we are going to encourage business and then say, oh, you made a mistake, but we're going to pick up the slack for your mistake. I don't like that at all. And we've seen some of that in this community, too. This may not have been a good idea, or you may not have thought this out. But hey, we'll just, we'll just pick it up. We can do that. We don't mind paying more taxes. What the heck? We've got situations now that uh, we're faced with that. And we're going to have to make some choices in just the next couple of years as to whether we want to enforce some rules, tell people that they can't understand, learn to read. talk on business for quite a while. Um, we've, I've, uh, I've spent a lot, number of uh, number of my early years starting up Cascade Pro Auto, working around Chamber of Commerce, that kind of thing, and, and helping out with their different things and, and being involved in that. Um, and then uh, and then figuring out, you know, I gotta fix cars. I, that's that's what I really gotta do, and I gotta do it well. Um, so it kind of had to back off from some of those kind of uh, activities. Um, and business is, is uh, I think there's a common theme with rather it be the city of businesses, churches, schools, um, in state. And the common theme is we are at a size that requires a, a certain level of services. And that level of services is the same level of service that I believe um, is required for a town of 10,000. And here we sit at seven. And we have the payers for 7,000. But we, we, the, the level of service that we expect for this type of town is the same type, the amount of service that it would take for a, a town of 10,000. Um, do we need 3,000 people? No. And, uh, or should we shrink, you know, and uh, decide we want 5,000? Who are we going to throw out? You know, we're not doing that. Um, we're not bringing in cranes tomorrow, and you know, build like crazy. But it does need to grow for for things like um, other shopping um, alternatives or in other restaurants and that kind of thing. I've been around a little while, and I've seen restaurants come and go, and it, and it is really bad when you when you get in there. And, and the thing is, when 
because you talk to most people around and they want a nice restaurant to go to. They're begging for a nice restaurant. And, you, and one opens up and everybody goes at once and they don't have a great experience and they don't go back for a long time and they're not able to pay the bills right away. So they're not able to keep it going, and and so then they got to scale things down, and then they scale things down. It's just this, it's just this bad, bad, bad um, <coughs> process. So you see restaurants come and go, you see different types of business startups and, and go, and it has one thing in common, and it's that we're seven thousand people, um, and yes, you can't really count the neighboring towns. Those are different towns. The town is seven thousand. Um, 78, 20, yeah. and then they drop 20. So <laughs> we're, we're at 7,800. Okay, everybody wants to grab the, round that up to 8,000. So um, a couple thousand people, um, not overnight, not, nothing like that, but responsible growth is what this town needs. Um, we're not necessarily a bedroom community. A lot of people drive here to work. Thank you. Our next question, we'll start with Paige. What do you feel is our community's single greatest asset? Our community's single greatest asset. Um, I single. Well, there's like almost eight thousand people, and I feel like the people in our community are our single greatest asset. I have met a lot of people um, knocking doors in other um, uh, areas, going you know shopping or school events or um, just all <coughs> sorts of different things. There was a park planning meeting that I attended that was really great to meet people at and uh, the people here are great. Everyone's friendly. I mean, there are people that are not friendly <laughs> everywhere, but everyone is friendly here. Like, I haven't, um, I, I love our town. I, that's why I wanted to move back here. That's why I wanted to raise my kids here because I love the people that are here. I love um, that, you know, when when I needed someone to take my daughter to a ballet thing, I could call. I could call my neighbor, and she took her there. And I, I don't know my neighbor that well, but I know her enough to know that she's a great person. I, I love that I know almost all the neighbors on my streets' names. Um, and you can't get that in, in Salem. You can't get that. I don't know that you can get that really anywhere else other than Staten. Staten's great. I, I love meeting people at the city council meetings. Um, we got a few very regular attenders, like like myself, um, in in the audience right now, and um, I just love the the passion that everyone has for this community. Um, sometimes it's passion in their own way. Uh, sometimes it's on an online forum, but we have some people that are on some of these online forums for Staten that they have great ideas. Um, I know that the teen center, uh, the idea of a teen center came about that way, and um, the uh, recent uh, downtown cleanups that have happened that Ben Silvernagel uh, started on an online forum. Um, just these great things. People care about the community. They want it to be better. Um, and I would love to take, you know, David Patty said this in his uh, voters pamphlet statement, that he'd love to see, you know, that passion from the forums come to the community meetings. And I. I want to see that happen too. I want to see more people come. I want to hear more voices. I, the people in our community are our greatest asset, single asset. Ralph, what do you feel is our community's single greatest asset? Get up. <laughs> <coughs> um, I agree. Um, I've never lived anywhere else um, where people are nicer than they are here. Um, where you can walk downtown and people say hello to you. Um, where you can go to the park and you can meet people. Um, I guess the other the other thing that would jump out at me would be the parks. Um, I love the parks in this town. Uh, so I guess the parks and the people. Jordan, what do you feel is our community's single greatest asset? Well, you know, um, not to jump on the bandwagon, but the people. Uh, but that's always. I feel like that's the first thing that's going to come to your mind. But for me, it's the doers in the community. And I've met several of them. Um, and again, uh, lots of you, I'm looking at you, you're in the audience, um, that just have a passion for making this town um, a better place. They're not just living here, but they really 
are invested in seeing it thrive. Um, the people at RDS that really want to see the downtown revitalized and they want people to come in into our town. They want it to succeed. They want those businesses down there to succeed. Um, the, the city staff even, um, I've met with several of them. Um, I met with the chief of police. It was really awesome to hear um, about their philosophies and how they um, work in the community. They're not just there to answer to calls. They are there to check on the people and see what is the next step. How can we help them further? Um, we have a lot of doers in this community and I feel like that's what makes it great. The people that are willing to jump on, you know, get up here on this stage. We're all really nervous. I've been nervous for weeks. Um, but all of you up here, um, I mean, these are the people that uh, regardless if we get on the city council, you know, that are going to be active in the community and that are going to make it, continue to make it great. David, what do you feel is our community's single greatest asset? Well, I'm not going to beat the dead horse of the people, <laughs> because I think that's been spoken on. Um, one thing that jumped out at me after that, obviously, is um, the downtown experience is really awesome. Uh, you know, people talk about Silverton, and that's fine, or whatever, They're, they got their own thing going on, but I think what we have is really, it, it has a different feel to it, right? So I go down, I can go work out at my gym, I can go, you know, see a movie at the movie theater, whatnot, I can go complain to Rich Stevens about people speeding in my neighborhood right after that, and then I can go get money at US Bank from the ATM or whatnot. And just all the people that you interact with there, and they, they all really care about this community, all the business owners, the shop owners, you know, the, the city employees, you talk to them and it's like, they really believe in it. They really, they, they believe in this community. They see something unique about it too, like all of us do, I think. And they like being a part of that. And I think that's really cool. I don't think that you see that as much in places like Salem or other big cities like Portland. And I enjoy being a part of that. Yeah. Thank you. Inc., what do you feel is our community's single greatest asset? It's already been said. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, uh, the things that Sandy and I enjoy uh, are the things that mean we don't have to run to Salem for everything. The shopping, the stores, the hospital, a real asset, this library, um, <laughs> schools, churches, um, the physical assets of this community are, are, are enough to keep us here. We, we just don't have to run off to uh, find things to do. And part of it is, is being almost senior citizens. It's, you know, things have slowed down a little bit. Um, don't like to admit it, but, uh, but it's, it's easier to stay at home. And there's... You know, we, we brag about in an hour you can be at the coast, in an hour you can be in the mountains. This is the perfect place. And it, for, for many, it is. But it's, um, it's home. And it's been home for 50 years. And it's enough for us. I don't wait for time to run out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to just give it away to some of us. No. <laughs> no. We've already done enough promotion tonight. Uh, I'm done. What are we next? Scott, what do you feel is our community's single greatest asset? Besides the state sublimity chamber of commerce, and I absolutely respect uh, everybody's time. Um, I uh, I'm going to say the the most uh, the most uh, important um, city asset <laughs> is the water treatment plant. Without water, there's no life. <laughs> One on the opposite end, sewer treatment. Priscilla. Now that's that uh, can be different. That's the most expensive. Priscilla, what do you feel is our community's single greatest asset? So I am going to jump on the bandwagon and say it is the people. However, I'm going to put a caveat on it. It, it. It's wonderful that we have all of these wonderful people, but how do we utilize them? Where's the plan with actually 
uh, tapping in to all of these wonderful people that we have that have some tremendous things to bring to the table that we don't even know about that are in their homes. So one of the ways uh, I was really excited when the Ford Family Foundation came to town, many of us were trained as local uh, leaders uh, to try for to learn different ways to try and engage people locally. Mm -hmm. And so I would agree that we have a wonderful group of people, but I would say that we need to do a much better job of learning how to tap into that, what we have locally, and how do we get more people actually involved and more people actually bringing the gifts that they have to the community to, to get passionate about what their uh, passion is. I would say the greatest single physical thing that we have in our community is the waterway that runs through our downtown. And the fact that, that I would love to see some kind of plan or ability for us to utilize that. Other cities have utilized that. Certainly we are not Silverton, but there's something that's called terminal uniqueness. If you decide that you are so unique that you can't learn from where other places are, you will die. And you have got to look at how other places went from dead downtowns to thriving downtowns find out what they did and at least try to do some of the same things that they did and have get some of the benefits that they have gotten. And so I would love to see all of the wonderful people that we have in this town actually be utilized more and find a way to engage them more in the community. Ralph, the next question is for you. What do you see uh, as some of the challenges we face as a community? <clears throat> challenges. Challenges are everywhere. I think challenges are what make uh, being a human being um, a worthwhile experience, working through those challenges. Um, I think it's been mentioned before about Staten being a bedroom community, and I think we trip over that a lot. <coughs> I think that's one that, that uh, needs to be um, permanently erased, <laughs> if, if possible. Um, I think um, being prepared, uh, we have all these um, rumors and studies and the like telling us that we're going to have this huge earthquake in the next 50 years. We need to know that, that this is a safe place. Um, I think, um, also as mentioned before, some of the rules that we have that seem to just be there because, um, some of those need to be fixed um, to make it so that um, some of the things that we really want um, can more easily be obtained. Um, I think that's probably it. Jordan, what do you see as some of the challenges we face as a community? Uh, thank you for the question. So, the reason that I got interested in coming to city council meetings and being involved in this process was initially uh, when we moved in, the road that we live on um, is pretty run down and, and beaten down, um, several potholes, and it's just, it's pretty, pretty much falling apart. And so I, you know, I was thinking to myself, what's going on here? What, you know, what's, you know, why, why are we having these issues? I would try to, um, I live fairly close to downtown and I would try to um, take my stroller and my kids and walk downtown and um, half the roads don't have sidewalks so the sidewalks um, aren't uh, really um, able, you're not really able to navigate them uh, with the stroller, let alone uh, walking around if you're trying to uh, run for exercise and things like that. So um, that is really what got me passionate about this. Um, and then. In looking at that, I stumbled upon also our issue of um, the need to update our utilities and sewer systems um, in those areas. So it's not only issues with the roads, but it's also um, you know that the utility part of the infrastructure. Um, I, I feel like that is you know there's we have made several strides. I'm so excited to see lots of the roads. Um, that have been improved, and um, that's one of my priorities is just to make sure that we continue um, 
making that a priority to fix those places. And it's not an easy fix, and I, I really understand that, but working with uh, the city and trying to figure out how we can um, make those better. Uh, and then something that Priscilla also said, um, one of the things that I'm passionate about is encouraging the community input, but how do we get people involved? So not just giving us, you know, complaining or telling us what's wrong, but how do we get them involved in making um, making those changes and making that better and tapping into those people? And so, um, you know, there's the same way that there's different learners, we have lots of different generations and lots of the generations do things differently. So coming up with creative ways to get um, people involved is, is one of the things, one of the challenges that we face and something that if we can figure out that um, you know, they can help us, you know, together with the council make this a better community. Thank you. Dan, what do you see as some of the challenges we face as a community? <clears throat> well, first off, I'd like to touch on the road issue that she discussed. I think that's really important to understand kind of the implications with that. Um, so they have something called the Pacer Scale that the city goes on, and it's a 1 to 10 scale of how usable a road is, if it's falling apart and whatnot. And there's parts of Satan that are rated as a one. And it's weighing in, okay, how many people are traveling on this road? How bad is it? How should we invest the city's resources into it, right? So roughly a block costs about $100,000, if I remember, to redo the whole, you know, the uh, road and then the sewer system and all that. So we gotta figure out how to best use our money, right? and how it's going to make the greatest impact for the community and then weighing in the community's input of you know how the roads you know disrepair is impacting them and hearing them out and weighing all those different voices equally right the other thing that's really big and i'm sure other people are going to touch on this because i know you guys are all aware of this the detroit lake is prospectively going to be drained i mean that's a huge issue and that's really going to impact our community and we really need to have a plan for that and how to address that if that's going to go through, which it looks like it will. Uh, we need to know where we're getting our water. We need to have a plan for the depressed, you know, economical effect that's going to have. Uh, so the other thing too, and I mentioned this in the voters pamphlet, uh, Paige talked about that a little bit, is you know, oftentimes we, we see people on groups and pages, and that's awesome. It's awesome when I see people voice a problem in the community because I, I keep that in the back of my mind and I would like to see some of those people have their voice heard right at city council meetings because that's the disconnect is these people weigh in on these online forums but then oftentimes that's not heard at a city council meeting <coughs> yeah that's going to make these meetings a little bit longer and probably more painful but you know what it's a good thing because it's more inclusion it's more community engagement and that's really important in a small town like this because we're such a small town, we can have our own voices heard so easily. It's not like a, you know, a meeting up in Portland where there's lines out the door, people are yelling about the same thing. We have individual voices. Let's use them. Let's hear them and use that input for something constructive. Hank, what do you see as some of the challenges we face as a community? Hmm. Well, that water issue is certainly one. Um, I guess everyone knows the, the basics on it, though. Corps of Engineers is mandated to, and probably U.S. Fish and Wildlife mandated to protect migratory fish, which means they have to get a way to get up over that several hundred foot dam. Pretty good trick for a fish, and into the lake and up to the headwaters to propagate the next generation. Nice to see someone mention generations here, so all these young people aren't, uh, um, anyway. Um, so I went to one of these meetings, a couple of them actually, and I asked, and I thought it was a clever question. And it said, uh, okay, you guys uh, are ignoring the multiple uses of those dams, which is uh, water retention, uh, irrigation, recreation, uh, flood control, and downstream water supplies. 
you're focused on one. So that's all you have to do is focus on the fish. So I asked this clever question. I says, where are you going to get the money? Well, here's the ringer. I've got them now. This thing's expensive, a couple hundred million dollars. The guy sits up there in the front. He says, well, we've got a fund of about 800 million we can draw from. Oh, okay. Took care of that. On we go. City of Salem, Marion County. We're not involved in that lawsuit. That's one that we're not in yet. <laughs> um, are suing the Corps uh, for, you know, what are they going to do for water supplies? Uh, all <coughs> those downstream folks that really depend on that reservoir. And it looks like it's been overlooked. I don't know what the answer is, but it is a pressing problem in the next two to four to five years. And we are going to be needing to, and we've been talking about it. We talked about it yesterday morning. At, with the county commissioners. Um, they said, well, are you identifying alternate sources of water? <laughs> and we said, well, we have drilled extra wells, and they don't come up to adequately meet our needs. Uh, what does NORPAC do? Big employer talking about business. What's NORPAC do without the uh, mm -hmm. millions of gallons of water they use? Shut it down. Do it works. Thank you. Problems, problems. Thank you again. Scott, what do you see as some of the challenges we face as a community? Well, with that, would you agree that the water treatment facility would be the greatest asset? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it's pretty important. Uh, so, uh, we, uh, yeah. The, the city of Staten's um, role in all that is uh, to say, hey, we're here, forget about, forget about us. Uh, but yeah, it seems like they're just uh, worried about Salem's water. So yeah, that's our water as well. Um, but as we grow, and we are growing, um, then we do it in a responsible way. Um, we've got intersections that need to be improved to be able to handle that kind of traffic out on Wilco Road. The whole Wilco Road is kind of a mess. And that's going to take care, that's going to take partnering, partnering with the county, um, getting that um, getting that together. I mean, you got a big intersection down there that uh, is a mess. Um, and at certain times of day, it's just you know, try to avoid you know, that, that section. But some people, a lot of people can't. You, no. you have people coming off the highway, they're, they're you know, they're eight to fivers. They're coming off the highway, and there's a lot of people going out of town. Um, it, it, it amazes me that the, the last census that came around, that it was within a couple of hundred people that leave town to come into town. I mean, these guys are passing each other every day on the road. They um, that work here, but yet they live in Salem or they live out of town somewhere else, and there's people that live here and go the same way. Um, so, uh, and, and then another challenge that we have in, in growth is going to be um, what do we do with the, the storm water that we create because of impervious surfaces. So we've got a great fund that's that's put together now where we put half a million dollars on pavement now. But if we pave those places that are currently gravel, that's going to create storm water somewhere. And well, we need to we need to be able to direct that some somewhere and be able to contain it. And, and uh, that I think I think storm water is a pretty big challenge. Um, when it comes to um, development. I think that's what a lot of builders and a lot of um, developers have had um, challenges with is, uh, great, I've got a good idea, it's going to work, it's good, it can be built, but where do we put all this water that's going to flood? Priscilla, what do you see as some of the challenges we face as a community? Well, I think the challenge is how hard it is for human beings to change including myself. The individuals in this community that, again, are one of our greatest assets, very, very difficult to make actual change in things. I, I think some things need to be changed. If you were to talk to the planning department, uh, Mr. Fleshman right now, who I happen to like very much, would tell you this is his one of his <coughs> things. Priscilla hates rules. Mm -hmm. Priscilla doesn't like rules. It's not true. 
the truth is, is I believe that rules are guidelines for what, how we need to work. But there are always things that can be done for the good of all that sometimes maybe need to go out of that rule. And when you have, when everything is black and white, when somebody walks in and says, wow, I'd like to do a business and I'd like to do this, and you say, oh, no, you can't do that because there's not, uh, there's a rule that says you can't do that, that's one thing. When you walk in and you say, I want to start a business here, and you say, tell me what you want to do. Let's talk about it. You can still have the very same no at the end with a totally different outcome, with saying, Let's look at what you want to do, and let's see if there's some way that we can do it. The minute that you put the no first, you've stopped the conversation, and the person leaves feeling like they aren't heard. You can be right and be very wrong. The city has been involved in numerous lawsuits recently. We, you know what, we could win them, and we are right in the right, but we have hurt long-term partners in this community that we will never maybe be able to reestablish the relationships that we've had with them. We were right, but you know what? We're the losers. And so we need to look at maybe a change in some of the way that we deal with things, some of the, the policies that we have, certainly, but, but we need a little bit of a culture change. And that is really, really hard for, for a lot of people to kind of look at becoming a more welcoming culture and a, a, a place where ideas and innovation and entrepreneurship is looked at with value. So that, that's, I think that sometimes people who are our greatest asset can also be one of our greatest challenges. Paige, what do you see as some of the challenges we face in the community? So um, a lot of people have already said some really important challenges, especially, you know, the water that's a, a pressing one. It's time sensitive. Um, I've talked to the city manager about that issue um, quite a bit, and he, I have full confidence that um, he and the city staff, they're working on it. They are really involved in, in the meetings and, the, and um, pressing, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers to uh, consider that uh, this is our water source. This is how we do our dishes and our drink our water and um, you know clean the re restaurants use to clean dishes um, so we can't have um, murky contaminated water and our water system won't be able to handle that kind of uh, sludge I guess um, so that's an important issue but um, you know also the the roads that they that they touched on uh, there are multiple figurative and literal layers to fixing some of the worst roads and I you know, being a, I was uh, able to have the opportunity to be the vice chair of the budget committee this year, and it was my first time on the budget committee, and um, it was eye-opening to um, see what that process is like. And I think that a lot of us made it really clear that we want to see road, some of these worst roads in Staten prioritized, and um, that's going to take a lot of uh, education to the community members so let them know what that cost is that David was talking about. Um, and that uh, we may have to juggle some other uh, finances to, to be able to put our new uh, road tax dollars to work in, in some of these level one roads. Um, and so uh, I, could, you know, I could talk about that, but um, for me, one of my passions is you know, affordable housing. Uh, we're in an affordable housing crisis, and our average income for residents is not at the level of what we can <coughs> afford in our community. I mean, a two-bedroom duplex costs fourteen hundred dollars. Um, it's an insane amount of amount of money for someone. Uh, you know, a lot of the people in our in our community for them to be able to afford um, three hundred thousand dollar homes. They are beautiful to look at. Um, but as a council, uh, if I'm elected to the council, I would love to figure out how we can all work together to find. Um, and encourage developers to build more affordable housing and um, something where our residents can become homeowners too. Um, I want to see some uh, codes updated, whether they're uh, land use codes or um, some other codes, some other, some other of the city's codes uh, that protect renters so that there aren't no cause evictions and uh, we don't have sewer uh, sewage dropping down walls. Um, I know the council worked hard on that 
uh, this last year uh, protecting, um, it was brought about because of a particular uh, rental area that um, literally our residents had that. They had sewage going down their, their walls. Um, so I feel like we can do a lot of change. We can update our codes. We can protect renters and um, also protect property owners at the same time. So. One of the challenges we're facing is that we're running very long on time, and so I think with that we'll stop there. Um, I know we wanted to reserve some time for the candidates to be able to chat with members of the community. Um, at this time, we're going to open the forum up to the audience. No new questions may be asked. However, you may ask for a clarification from a candidate regarding a statement they have made previously during the forum. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand and ask for a clarification, please do. Anybody? Russ? Well, this is directed toward all of you. You all say that you want more business in, and you say that we've got a good working relationship with city staff. Uh, I've talked to some of you, and there's a lot of headbutting every time somebody wants to come and open a business. And, you know, I could come up with a lot of names. So my challenge to you would be, don't be afraid to go to city staff and say, this needs to be changed. And I heard some of you say that. And I really hope you'll come through and make some changes within city staff to make it more, you know, Satan is, has an atmosphere of being very anti-business. And I hope all of you will work to change that with city staff. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question or a clarification. Hank, you said earlier you take more of a passive role as a mayor, and, and I understand what that means, but if we vote for you, can we expect you to actually be the leaders in our community and, and think freely and open-minded to lead our community? Because I kind of think right now I feel like we're not there. Okay, well, Alan, you can, uh, you can have a hard-charging uh, mayor, but that's not the role. <coughs> not the role. That's, that's not, that person does not dictate uh, policy to the staff and to the council. It's just not the, not the way it's configured. Um, you, can have, you can have battles on day one if you want, but that's not what I, I chose to do. Right. I chose to see if we can't work together, uh, make some positive changes, plan our growth, accommodate as much as we can, uh, tell people, yes, you've got a good idea, or no, you don't, or you need to do this to fit into our community. I've chosen that role. Okay. And I would just like to, you know, comment on that point, Hank, is that we vote for you to be the leaders of our community. And I hope when we vote for you, you will be the leaders of our community. And I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Um, all right, so uh, I, I'm really glad that you so have been made that comment or question. Um, I feel like I definitely can be that leader, and I know that I have said that you know, I have confidence in the city staff, and I do, but I also am bold, and I also uh, ask questions and send really long emails to the city staff asking why, uh, you know, why when we do a slurry seal is part of it coming up already, and they give these great answers as to why and what the purpose is and it's this great you know educational time for me where um, I'm learning as uh, residents will be learning too I got a letter as a planning commissioner from one of my neighbors that um, said that you know she was really upset about the process that that uh, of notification and and how the story deal uh, came about and she sent it to everyone I was the only one that knocked her door she said and um, I that's when I, that what prompted me talking to a few of my neighbors after I received the letter and, go, and going, you know, I was a little upset about it too. And then, you know, holding the city staff accountable and having them um, explain to me why something happened and then they are identifying, you know, how that could be better in the future. You know, going forward, where their possible missteps may have been or um, how, how they could communicate better in the future uh, and, and lay out expectations and, you know, contracts that, you know, we, we, we want a certain type of quality also. Um, so I feel like I, if you watch some of the YouTube videos which I referenced, you'll see I've stood up in the council meetings and I have said um, really bold things. Um, I'm not afraid to speak. I'm not afraid to keep meetings 
running longer than what is socially acceptable um, for what people normally want, just so that I can make sure that we have heard everyone's voice. Um, I'm not afraid to be looked at uh, in a condescending way when I have a question, um, and then, and because I want more people's voices to be heard, even if they're not city residents, um, they're on the outskirts, that they will eventually be city residents, and I'm okay with um, getting those looks, and I'm okay with people not agreeing that we should be staying as long as we are, but um, what came about of, of the one I'm talking about is we had people showing up to the next planning commission meeting, and they stayed for a almost three hour meeting just to have their voices heard on an issue that we were possibly going to be um, uh, telling Marion County, yes, go ahead and do this, or no, don't do this. Um, so I feel like I've already proven that I'm, I'm a candidate that's willing to, to do that, that's willing to speak up, that's willing to maybe not be everyone's friend, but uh, also uh, collaborate and try to move things forward um, at the same time. So. Um, the the uh, the question was brought up about what what type of leader or leadership you use and if you're if you're passive or aggressive. Um, I just wanted to to uh, to express my feelings of uh, the the leadership style that should be taking place in the elected body, the mayor or city council or any kind of board that you're on. It it should be it should be hands down a servant leader and. And what defines a servant leader? There's tons of things that define a servant leader. The main thing is that you're looking out for the entire group. You're not, you're not out for yourself, and, you're, and you want the people who do their job to do their jobs well. And you try to put them in the positions to do those jobs the best they can. Um, when they do great, you want them to be recognized. When they, when they don't do so great, you'll be there to take the hit for them. Um, and, and try to figure out where, how to learn and how to move on from there. Um, because you're not going to have, you're not going to lead anything if you don't have anybody that can support you and follow you and get on board with you. So, um, is that passive? Is it aggressive? It's a little bit of both in different times. The one of the main things you've got to be very cautious of is going in the direction of being passive aggressive, where you're just everything's cool until it's not, <coughs> and then now we've got a problem where if, where you can take care of those problems well ahead of time. You're ahead of the game. Um, I wanted to speak to what you had said. Um, <coughs> oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, about being a state and being business friendly, and I just wanted to reiterate that something that was um, set up here is that we, in order to make sure that we are business friendly, we need to look at our policies and make sure that they do welcome new businesses or encourage business growth. Uh, that's one thing that we can do as a council and take a look at those and make sure that they are on track with our goals. Uh, we, can't, we can't change the rules for one person. So we need to make sure that the rules that are there, that people are following them and that they are cohesive and they're easy to follow and people don't get confused to the point where they just give up. Uh, that's what I think we need to focus on. Um, if you make exceptions for one, then you have to start making exceptions for one. And that's, I feel like, um, really where the problem comes in is that maybe in the past that some that things have not been going by the rules and then someone else comes up and says well you let so and so do it you know well, you're not going to let me do it and that's where people get upset so we need to make sure that our rules um, are easy for everyone to follow and that it encourages the business growth. With that Carmel do you want to wrap things up? Thank you everybody for coming. Um, we are out of time for the, the question portion, but I want to thank the candidates again for uh, sharing their time with us. Stick around. Uh, we have till 8.30 in here. Um, there's refreshments in the back, and we would love to, if you guys would stick around a little bit, and people can ask questions or get to know you guys better. Uh, can I say something really briefly? Sure. I think I just wanted to take note of something that, uh, for as long as I have been in Staten, which is, like I said, 12 years, this is the most people yeah. I have ever seen run mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are all so darn qualified. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, yeah. that says something.
kind of about the direction of our growth at this point, which, which may, encourages me uh, tremendously that we would have this many young people want to be so involved in their community. So it's not just community. us that have to carry the load for so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited for whatever happens. Uh, could you tell me which council positions are open and how many? Which council is not running now or how many council positions are open? Go ahead, Ken. Um, so there's three positions that are open for election. Um, uh, Councillor Joe Usselman, he is not running again. Um, also, uh, Councillor Cronquist, Cronquist did not file for office either, so those are completely like open positions at this point. Um, Councillor Glidewell, she is obviously running, um, but all the seats are technically open. It's the top three people that get the most votes uh, get the seats, and so, um, and they're four-year terms. So you get to <coughs> vote for, there's five of us on the ballot for uh, council, you get to vote for three. Um, you don't have to vote for three, but um, I think we've got enough great candidates that everyone should be voting for three. That's so. I think your 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 problem is going to be which three because like yes. I said, yes. Yes. I think that for the first time we have an incredible group of people. Right?